So it's been about, what, two, almost three weeks since Avengers Endgame has been out. So I figure time to start dropping some more videos on, you know, spoiler stuff so everybody can come check them out here on World of Geekdom. And I wanted to talk about Iron Man's arc in the film. But, of course, I will give you a spoiler warning just in case you're one of the few who has not seen the movie. The movie's made so much money and broke so many records. I feel like almost everybody by this point has seen it, but you never know. Just trying to be safe on that. Let's talk about Iron Man's arc. I think the most emotional stuff in the film in Avengers Endgame was all the stuff with Tony Stark. Not just his, you know, his his discovery of peace with his wife and daughter and the I Love You 3000 and that kind of stuff. Not just the scene with him and his father, which was very, very emotionally powerful, but also his passing at the end of the film, his death, and the funeral for him afterward. You know, that was meant to be emotional because... Obviously, Iron Man was the first film in the MCU. Tony Stark began this journey, and when it first happened, nobody thought it was going to get this far. I know I certainly didn't think they were going to do 22 movies. I figured just a handful, and they'd be done. Um, maybe Avengers, a couple more of those, and then we're out of here. But we got 22 movies, three a year now. Uh, and it all started with Iron Man. But also, the arc of the character, I think, is, is the really what I think makes Tony Stark in the MCU the theatrical version, so powerful. That even though Iron Man 2 and 3 are not seen as being great movies, most of the fans don't really like those movies that much, they're usually not very well received, they still helped mold this character that we've seen for all these different movies. He was in Homecoming, he was in Civil War. And really, a lot of this was, to me, just a great arc. Because you've got a character like Iron Man who, when we see him in the first Iron Man film... He's very egocentric, he's very full of himself, he's very cocky, but he's also a genius, so he has a reason to be. And he is essentially seen by others as being a selfish person. He wants to keep the Iron Man power to himself, and eventually, of course, in the sequel, Rhodey gets the war machine suit. But, uh, you know, Iron Man was kind of this guy who was rough on the surface, but there was a likable quality about him. You know, and Pepper Potts saw that in the film, and... Because he's kind of a sweet guy, even though he's arrogant. And uh, it makes you think about people on the internet, personalities. Like, you know, when you see people acting a certain way on the internet, they're not always like that in real life. You know what I mean? Like, if somebody's egotistical on YouTube or whatever, or just, you know, just being cocky, they might have a nice side to them. They probably do have a good side to them, because I do believe most human beings have a good side to them, even though I do think there are some people in the world who don't. Um, most human beings, I would say, have a good side to them. There's a small handful of people who don't, sociopathic people and whatnot. Uh, but still, you know, uh, he was a character that we all kind of liked because, you know, and Robert Downey did a great job playing him. There's a reason why he got, he's making so much money. He just, he really did build this thing, you know, from the first Iron Man movie. And as the films progressed, we saw him become less and less egocentric and more and more loving towards Pepper, towards his friends. Uh, in, in the Avengers film, you know, the death of Phil Coulson really impacted him. And he was able to work with Captain America, who he had a, a beef with earlier in the movie, and the rest of the Avengers to win. You know, and then with Iron Man 3, it's kind of like him recovering from the trauma that was New York. And Iron Man 3's got a lot of problems, but Iron Man 3 really does show kind of Pepper and Tony's relationship really getting strong. Like, they really were a lot stronger there in that film. And then in Civil War, the story kind of shifted over to Tony's parents. And, of course, if you watch the other Iron Man movies, you know how much Tony was. I don't know if, if idolize is the right word, but he really did love his father. He really, I guess idolize is the right word. Howard Stark, although he was not a perfect man, and he did do things that, he did make mistakes just like Tony, he was ultimately a good man. And the scene in Endgame where he gets to go back in time and meet his father, you know, it really does kind of resonate with people who either never knew their dad or lost their dad at one time. Just it, It's kind of interesting just to think about being able to go back and talk to your parents when they were young. Of course, Back to the Future was the first film to really explore this, more for comedic purposes, but it's still the first movie that, even though it's a comedy, it's very thought-provoking. You know, you, you see the movie, you start thinking, you know, uh, what if I did that? What if I went to go back in time and saw my parents in high school? How... 
how different were they? How weird were they? How hypocritical are they to clown us for doing things that they did when they were younger? You know, that's the whole joke of Back to the Future. In this movie, it twisted it to it being a much more emotional situation for Tony because he sees not just his father, but his father, what, right before Tony's born? Right when his wife is pregnant and, and going to pop? And it just as a father, as a man who was someone that, you know, loves his daughter and was with her for four years, four and a half years, uh, Morgan, you know, he was able to give his own dad kind of some, you know, they, they can relate as far as being a parent goes. It was a very powerful scene because I know a lot of people saw Iron Man 1, um, you know, when it was in theaters 11 years ago. And now a lot of those same people have kids and they took them to go see this movie. Think about that for a minute. Like, Think about how crazy the passage of time is, right? So that scene's probably extra powerful. Same thing with the scene of Tony. Um, you know, the whole arc of Tony is that he really, really was affected by his parents' death, as you can see in Civil War when he tried to damn near kill Bucky when he found out that Bucky was brainwashed and killed his parents. You know, he was obsessed with that. It affected him. But at the same time, He's also a guy who wants a solution to everything, and he wants to do the right thing. And the thing about Tony Stark is he's always wanted to do the right thing, even though he's still an arrogant guy. He still has a moral compass. And to me, it's interesting because in Age of Ultron, the whole story there was that he wanted to create a suit of armor all over the world to protect the whole world. And, and he brings that up again in Endgame when he confronts Captain America about it. Obviously, that idea of having a suit of armor, artificial intelligence controlling it, in theory, is a good idea. But it's like the whole Terminator thing is that when the machines get smart, you know, and it's kind of scary to think about that. But when the machines get smart, you know, they might not they might not necessarily have a moral compass, which is what makes us different than them. You know, and if you don't believe me on that one, go watch Star Trek The Motion Picture because that really analyzes how... You know, human beings are capable of doing things that machines can't do. Even though machines can calculate numbers faster than we can, they lack that that you know that emotional empathy and the the the, the ability to leap beyond logic. That's what human beings do. We do that. We 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 have that ability as a species, right? And as a result of that, Ultron logically was a very hateful person or a very hateful entity. But logically, he thought that the human beings were the biggest cause of the problems on Earth. And in, in, in many ways, he's right. I mean, he is right about that. But that plan failed because Ultron went crazy. And all he wanted to do was rest. All he wanted to do was... And it goes back to that scene where he's talking to Captain America where he's like, isn't the whole purpose of this so we can end the war so we don't have to fight? You know, and that's the truth. I mean, there's truth to that. Isn't the whole point of... Ending the war so we can have peace. And then Captain America's response was anytime somebody tries to end a war before it starts, people die. Which is also somewhat true, but at the same time, it's not Tony's intention that people are going to die. It's just that he wants there to be peace so he can rest. Which is interesting because if you watch Endgame, the scene where he tells Pepper by the fireplace or whatever and the couch that he discovered time travel, uh, that he figured out how to do it. She's like, you know, he's over here like, oh, I'm just going to put it away, put it in a drawer and forget about it, which I think is kind of an homage to the time machine uh, story where there's a scene where they go to an alternate reality where the main guy puts it away and lives his life, you know, regularly. Um, right. I think that might be where they got the idea from, but I'm not really sure either way. Uh, and then Pepper tells him, OK, yeah, but can you rest? Will you be able to rest? Will you be able to live with yourself knowing that you have a chance to save lives, half the universe, that you can do it? Can you really sleep at night knowing that with that on your conscience? And she's right. She was right. It's his one last, you know, Infinity War and Endgame was Tony Stark's one last hurrah. And that's what inspires him to finish the time machine or the time travel research and to do it. And he wound up achieving it, which is why at the end of the movie, when he dies, Pepper tells him, it's okay, Tony, we're going to be okay, you can rest now. And that's really powerful words from Pepper Potts, really powerful, because she didn't just, you know, you know, please don't go or any of that stuff, that's not what it was even about. She was just saying, now you can rest, you did it, you saved the world multiple times, but now you really saved the world, literally the universe uh, you know, him and do the time travel and, of course, the other Avengers, but he invented the time travel. He, he, he did it properly, you know. Uh, 
and now he can rest. And of course, you wonder what they're going to do now because they need a very powerful mind on Earth. Of course, it's a perfect chance to introduce Reed Richards at some point because he's a very genius character as well. Another human that can kind of replace Tony as being like the other genius besides Banner. And of course, we have Shuri, but uh, those three seem to be the, the smartest. Um, or they're going to upload Tony to AI in Phase 4. I mean, we'll see. They did that in the comics. I don't see why they won't do that in the movies. Um, but it was just a very powerful... It was very powerful and very done done well, I think, in the fact that he wound up wanting to create peace, and he did at the cost of his own life. But he was able to, and it's crazy because during those five years in between, like with the time skip when they killed Thanos all the way to Endgame, when, when Ant-Man comes out of the, uh, the quantum realm, right? He was at peace. Other than the fact that Peter Parker was dead, Tony Stark was perfectly happy in that cabin with his wife and daughter. He didn't want to fight anymore. He was retired. He was he was done. He was finished. His job was done. And yet, he still was compelled to come back based on a chance that they might be able to fix everything and save the world. But he didn't want to lose Morgan. And he wound up not losing Morgan, but Morgan lost him, which is the ultimate kind of Shakespearean tragedy here when it came to the endgame, which is why I think the movie resonates. You know, As, as a movie by itself, it doesn't work. Uh, Infinity War and Endgame don't work by themselves. You have to have the other movies there to make this mean more. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. You know, it has to be the the finale. Uh, you know, like people have said, it feels more like a TV show than a movie, um, and that's why. You know, because it has like that season finale thing going, just with a much bigger budget and on a bigger screen. That's essentially the the difference. Um, Kevin Feige has changed the way movies are made now for sure when it comes to this kind of uh, formula that he's pretty much invented. Even though it wasn't the first cinematic universe, he was the one that really made it a mainstream thing and everybody else wants to copy. So that's it for this video. I want to do a little dissection on Tony Stark's arc in Endgame or in the entire MCU. I think we'll see him again in the future. I really think Robert Downey will collect more checks from doing cameos, um, possibly prequels and things like that. I don't think we've seen the last of him, but, you know, and also if they do Secret Wars, they got to bring him back somehow. But we'll see what they do. We'll see what they do. Thanks for watching. Love you guys. Take care of yourself and each other.